driving snap switches or motorized turnout drives like tortoises requires a voltage pulse of various length and polarity. If you want to use a single pole dual position switch or a relay to activate this type of turnout drives, you have a problem as such a switch cannot generate a pulse of any length. In this video I am going to show you how to work around that problem. Welcome to the IOTT channel, I am Hans Tanner. Here is what I am going to cover in this video. The individual topics are shown in the timeline below, so you can use the progress slider to directly jump to the topic of interest. The idea for this board stems from a post in the Arduino for Model Railroading group on Facebook a few months ago. A group member showed an arrangement of a few capacitors, diodes and a relay contact that would generate a voltage pulse to the coils of a snap switch every time the relay changes position. It is easy to see how it works, but just in case. If the relay contact is in position A, the capacitors are charged from the power supply and the charging current is driving one coil of the snap switch through the diode in direction of the current flow. Once the capacitor is fully charged, the current stops flowing and both ends of the coil have the positive voltage of the power supply. If the relay changes to position B, one end of the coil is put to ground and the capacitor starts discharging through the coil and diode, thereby setting the turnout to the other direction. The purpose of the diode D, by the way, is to protect the positive voltage when the neighboring turnout is activated. So the core purpose of the circuit is to convert a level switch input from a relay contact or manual switch to a current pulse suitable for a snap switch. And when I saw that, I immediately thought about a still open problem I had with the green hat servo decoder. My original plan was to make the green hat outputs in a way they could drive pretty much every switch machine that is on the market, be it servo drives, snap switches or DC motors. Later on I gave up on that idea as the PCB space needed to make it work would have limited the number of channels on the same decoder to only four and the cost per channel were going through the roof. So the green hat at first became a 16 channel servo only decoder and with the first software revision I made the servo outputs to drive relays as well. This capacitor circuit therefore could then just be the missing link between the relay and typical snap switches, so I had a closer look at the Facebook post. Obviously the circuit is very simple, but it also has some disadvantages. The first is that the length of the current pulse depends on the size of the installed capacitor. Larger capacitor, longer pulse. This is a problem because the user must select the right capacitor size depending on the coil drive. And for motor drives like tortoises the capacitors would become very large. I was more looking for a solution that could easily be adapted by the user to different drive types. In the original post discussion there were also some concerns regarding some arching at the relay contacts and the suggestion that using an H-bridge driver might be the better way. And while I'm not really worried about the arching, I certainly liked the idea of using drivers to activate the coil. This not only allows to get rid of the capacitors, but it also makes it easy to make the pulse length adjustable, as we will see later. So these initial considerations led to this requirements list. A simple adjustable input level to pulse converter with input level of 3.3 or 5 volt drivable from level inputs like a switch or relay or from an open collector output for example from a current sensor and of course from a PCA9685 output. An adjustable output pulse from a few milliseconds to about 5 seconds. A wide supply voltage range but in particular support for a typical 12 to 16 volt switch drive voltage. 2 amps output current to drive even more demanding switch drives. 
These requirements would then allow for these use cases, an add-on output board for PCA9685 chips to drive some snap switches or tortoises from the same board that drives the servos, thereby eliminating the need for a separate decoder or for replacing all the drives by servos. Driving snap switches or tortoises from a level switch installed on a switch panel. Driving snap switches or tortoises from a single Arduino digital output pin. Driving snap switches or tortoises from an open collector sensor output, for example a current sensor occupancy decoder, to drive a level crossing gate. The working principle of the board is simple. I connect the coil or motor drive to the outputs of two H-bridges so that the ends can be driven to ground or supply voltage individually. The input lines of both bridges are connected to the level switch so that in principle both H-bridges are connecting the same polarity from the power supply to the switch drive. Therefore, the drive is normally off with both ends connected to either ground or supply voltage. And here comes the trick. One of the input lines is time delayed, so that it follows the level switch input a few milliseconds later, which then creates a short pulse to the switch drive with a polarity depending on the new level of the input. The delay is created by a resistor and a capacitor on the input side of a logic gate. The combined values of resistor and capacitor determine the time delay and by using a potentiometer instead of a resistor it becomes adjustable. That's it, conceptually. But of course when it comes to implementation there are a few more details to take care of, so let's look into the schematics. Let's start with the input connectors. There is one 3 pin connector for each channel. The sequence of the pins is identical with the PCA9685 outputs, so they can be connected using a standard servo cable. When connecting to a switch or relay, make sure to connect the signal input to the level contact and supply 5V and ground from the input board. That's it. The next block shows how to create the time delayed version of the input signal. The input signal is fed through the potentiometer to the capacitor and then to a logic gate input, so the input is delayed in both cases, raising or falling, depending on the settings of the potentiometer. The resistor in series with the potentiometer determines the minimum pulse length when the potentiometer is set all the way to zero. The pull-up resistor is needed to make the input work with open collector devices. Also, if nothing is connected, the pull-up ensures that the input signal is high and the status of the H-bridge clearly defined. This would not be needed though as the H-bridge chip has an internal pull-down resistor, so it would be defined but default low and in that case it would not work with open collector input devices. That's why I added this pull-up. The capacitor at the beginning is to filter out short spikes in the input signal. For example, bouncing of a switch or a relay. It is also needed for the PCA9685. That was actually a little surprising and you should be aware of that when doing PCA9685 projects. Here is what the output signal looks like if the PWM value is set to zero. Nothing over the full time period as expected. But here is how it looks like when setting the value to 4095, so the maximum value. As you see there are still some negative spikes at the end of the PWM period, so 100% PWM does not mean on all the time. Now this negative spike is filtered out by the input capacitor, so that the in signal is steady. In fact, with the selected value, the board filters out negative spikes down to a PWM value of about 4090 or so, so there is some reserve. The logic chip is an XOR gate with one input tied to ground, so the output follows the input. If the input goes high after the time delay, the XOR output does the same, exactly what is needed for the H-bridge. 
The special thing about the EXO chip though is the type of input. In order to make it work we need to use Schmidt trigger inputs. These types of input have a built-in hysteresis which is comparable to a debouncing effect. When the input voltage raises as the capacitor is charged, the gate switches from low to high, but because of the input hysteresis it will do it only once. It cannot fall back because the voltage to make it go low again is way slower than the level it is at when switching high. According to the datasheet, the difference between switch on and off voltages is around 1.4 volts, so we get a nice on function with no jitter. At the output of the XOR gate, we then have the delayed in signal as seen here. So we now can generate a pulse of adjustable length. These three pairs of input signals are then connected to the two driver chips. Each of them has three half H bridges, so together they offer three full H bridges. The reason I chose this chip is the input voltage range of up to 60 volts and the output current of up to 2.5 amps. It is mainly used for brushless motors, that's why there are three half bridges. Two of these chips combined make three switch drivers, so here you have the reason why the module has three channels and not two or four. The outputs offer the possibility to connect polarity sensitive drives like tortoises or Kato polarized switches on pins 0 and 1. Or traditional snap switches on pins A and B with the common wire on pin 0. You can see the diodes on pins A and B that select one or the other coil based on the applied polarity. That should make it possible to connect pretty much every commercially available drive type. The output voltage thereby depends on the voltage that is connected to the power connector and can be from about 10 up to 30 volts if needed. One last element worth mentioning is the onboard power regulator which generates an optional 5 volt supply for the logic chips from the switch voltage. To activate it you simply add bridges for ground and 5 volt and you now can operate the switch by connecting and releasing the input signal to ground. No external 5 volt power needed in that case. So you think that board would be useful for your layout and want to have one for yourself? Well, you have two options. You can conveniently order it from my Tandy page or you can make one yourself and save some money. To make your own, download the design information from my GitHub page listed below. It has everything you need, the PCB layout, bill of materials and pick and place data for the assembly robot. Upload the information to your PCB supplier of choice. I ordered mine from jlcpcb.com as I normally do. The reason is that in my opinion they have the most integrated and user-friendly web page for uploading the order. I looked at others like PCBWay or EECard but always found their processes to be more complex and cumbersome. On the JLC PCB page start with uploading the Gerber file which is then displayed on screen. You select your desired quantity and then click SMT assembly. On the next page you upload the bill of material file and the pick and place data. Next you select the components you want to have assembled. Here you need to have a closer look. First you need to check what they offer to assemble. Sometimes they are out of stock on some components and they will let you know. If that's the case you can source them from elsewhere and install them yourself once you have the boards or you choose to cancel and come back later to see if they are in stock again. In any case you need to deactivate the selection of the EXO chip as the chip in the bill of material is the standard input chip, not the one with Schmidt trigger input. Unfortunately the chip supplier of JLC PCB does not carry the Schmidt trigger version. But you can order it from Mauser and install it yourself, which is not complicated to do. The Mauser port number for the chip is in the description below. 
That's it, so you upload the order and about 10 days later the boards will show up in your mailbox. Quite convenient. You install any missing components and add the bridges to connect the power supply if you want to use the board as standalone board. Either install jumper pins or solder some wires between the marked pins. Or leave them open if you want to operate the board from a PCA9685 driver. Now you can connect for example a tortoise to pin 0 and 1 of the first module, connect a power supply to plus and minus, and as soon as you change the level on the input pin, you should see the switch drive moving. I like to test with a motorized drive first because it is easy to see the effects of changes to the potentiometer. Turn it left and you will only get a short tick on the motor. Turn it a little bit more to the right and the motor will probably move the tortoise about halfway. Turn it more to the right until the tortoise makes it to the end in both directions. That's the setting you are looking for. Note that the pulse length of the module is not exactly the same in both directions. This is a result of the voltage levels the XOR chip needs for turning off and on. There typically are a few tenths of a second difference, which normally is not a problem. Now you can connect a snap switch. Turn the potentiometer all the way to the left so the pulse is as short as possible. From what I have seen, the shortest pulse works with most of the snap switch turnouts, so you probably want to use this setting to avoid overheating of the coil. These switches are typically designed for an AC voltage of 50 or 60 Hz, so the current is limited by the impedance. When powered with DC, the current is only limited by the ohmic part of the resistance. Therefore, the current is getting higher quickly and that's why we need to limit the pulse length. Just to show you the difference, when feeding 15 volts AC with 60 Hz, the current is about 2 amps and the power dissipation of the coil therefore about 30 watts. Already in this case you want to keep the pulse short, but when powering it with 15 volt DC instead, the current is 3 amps, resulting in a power dissipation of 45 watts and the coil gets heated up even faster. So keep the pulse short. And that's it for this video. I hope this information was useful or at least interesting for you and you have learned something new about how to connect and operate turnouts on your layout. If so, please click the like button below to let me know. Leave a comment in the comment section below and subscribe to the channel so you are in a premium seat when new videos come out. Thanks for watching and see you next time.